There is a discussion to be had about whether or not the YouTube gaming sphere has a positive or a negative effect on games. It does sort of eliminate the need to actually play the game for yourself when you could just watch someone else do it. Especially if it's a more story-driven game where everything gets spoiled for you. The people watching it still get to experience it, but through the point of view of another person. But at the same time, it offers the opportunity to people who otherwise wouldn't have played the game at all. And honestly, how many game franchises have been introduced to a wide audience because YouTubers played them? The exposure so many games have gotten entirely because big figures played them for their millions and millions of fans cannot be understated. But how many of those fans actually go out and play the game for themselves? How many of them continue to follow and support the developer even if YouTubers aren't making videos on their games anymore? In early 2015, Markiplier uploaded a video with probably the most clickbaity title I've ever seen. This game will change your life. Wow, that's a big claim. I was 18 and new to the whole YouTube gaming sphere, so I immediately clicked without a thought and... Holy crap! Wow, okay. Okay, okay, that title is, is not unreasonable. How can a game with the graphics of Lego Island Ugh. I really, really wish that I discovered Presentable Liberty for myself, but at the same time, I am very confident in saying that I probably wouldn't have even known that it existed if it wasn't for Markiplier's video. And that's a shame, because Presentable Liberty and its predecessor, Exoptimal Money, are very, very simple games, but what they are able to accomplish despite that is pretty great in my opinion at least. I remember how deeply this game affected me when I was 18, and despite not playing it or watching Mark's video again until just recently, I never forgot about it. And it also affected a lot of other people too. Less than a year after it came out, someone made a play out of Presentable Liberty. Someone looked at this and was inspired to make an entire production based around it. What is it about these very simple games that struck such a chord with people? Well, I've decided I'm going to analyze the fuck out of them, and I hope you stick with me for this journey. I also hope you go and play these games for yourself. They're free and roughly an hour long. Please go experience them before I ruin them for you. Here are some content warnings for them, and they also apply to this video too. Cool? Cool. Okay. Exoptable Money is the most anti-capitalist game I have ever seen. This isn't much of a claim, I'm not much of a gamer, but like, the word exoptable means desire, right? So the title is basically, I want money. And that's a pretty accurate description of the game. You find a strange machine that, when turned on, starts suiting out money. As the game goes on, you could buy upgrades for the money machine, which causes it to spit out more and more money. You could also adopt this cat. It's a nice cat. It collects money for you, and it loves you. <laughs> Holy shit. You start racking up the dough, but then other people start to take notice of your success. Madame Sinclair jumps on board pretty quick, offering up new ways to make money, and this guy named Dr. Money? Wow. Starts insisting that you send him money to fund some kind of war. And it's, uh, huh. Wow, my... My cat's been gone a while. I sure hope he's okay. I, um, uh, oh. oh, oh no, no, oh, oh no, 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 no! <laughs> So yeah, this is a punch in the gut. Your cat has been skinned and murdered. It's gory and tragic. But, well, I guess since you have his fur, I mean, he's already dead, so... Ah, well, that's horrifying. Shit. Look how much money I'm making now, though. This is really speeding up the process. This game isn't exactly the most unique, it bears a striking resemblance to Cookie Clicker. So much so that the developer, WorkPole, points it out himself, but there is one major difference. In Cookie Clicker, you click. You actually have to lift a finger to put in a bit of work. In Exoptable Money though, you don't do shit. You just sit back and watch the profits roll in. Yeah, sure, every so often you'll set up to make an investment or two, buy an upgrade for the money machine, or some topaz, or... A tin can, that's a bit odd. 
But that's about as far as the effort goes. Once you get the ball rolling, you don't have to do anything. A lot of horrible things happen in this game, but you're never actually the one doing them. Sure, you're exploiting the fact that your cat loves you and does free labor on your behalf, but you weren't the one who killed it. That was Madame Sinclair, not you. But by selling the fur, you are taking advantage of the suffering of someone who is nothing less than loving and helpful towards you. As the game goes on, Dr. Money gets pissed at you for not sending him money and sends you a virus to force you to buy an antidote. He also apparently sent a virus to everyone else in the world because now everyone is dying and they need organs. Well, I guess I could go into the organ business. There is a demand for it after, oh dear god. Now, unlike the cat fur, the game does tell you that these organs aren't being harvested from people. They're being created by the money machine. But since they are fake organs being created by a magical money machine, they don't actually work and in fact kill the people buying them. Which means you're still profiting off of suffering. Worse still, right after you find this out, Dr. Money asks you to sell off the organs of your friends and family. So now you're just not profiting off human suffering, you're profiting off the suffering of your loved ones. But it's fine. You're not really the one doing it. At no point do you pick up a knife and start slashing at people. And that's kind of how it is in real life, isn't it? Very rarely are the people who profit off horrible things the ones getting their hands dirty. The CEOs who profit off child labor aren't in the sweatshops with a whip. The corporations who profit off destroying the rainforest aren't out there with chainsaws. Nope, they're sitting back in their offices watching their wealth grow higher and higher. And I want to make it clear that I'm not claiming exoptable money is unique in this regard. I mean, Cookie Clicker also shows the way that you're accruing your cookie empire is also rather scummy. But while you never see the effects of those scummy actions in Cookie Clicker, exoptable money does not let you forget what you've done. You can't watch your profits go up without seeing the evidence of the harm you cause spurting all over the place. You also have the ability to turn the money machine off. At any time, you can hit this little lever and the money machine scene just stops. And so does the gore. You're not actively causing pain anymore, but you're also not making any money. And of course the game isn't progressing either, and we can't have that. This has to be leading somewhere good, right? All of this has to be leading somewhere good, right? Madame Sinclair, the woman who helps you become a multi-millionaire by murdering your cat, succumbs to the virus, and then Dr. Money contacts you saying that he is a gift for you, but you have to prove to him that you're capable. And you do that. You make so much much money that the money machine literally breaks. Only then does Dr. Money finally offer you his gift, a can opener, and it only costs all your money. You finally get to open the can you bought at the beginning of the game, and you are so happy. Countless riches couldn't fulfill your life, but a simple can of beans is just the thing to put a smile on your face. Truly, this is a lesson about how it's the simple things in life. Oh, you're dead. Yep. After all that, after hurting and profiting off countless people, after betraying the woman who helped you get rich in the first place by leaving her to buy the cheap organs, you lose everything and die, just like everybody else. But here's the crazy part. So does is Dr. Money. Dr. Money, the guy who scammed you out of every cent you made and then declared you worthless, probably the most powerful figure in this world, dies. And not only that, but he died from a virus he created to profit off of desperate people. Dr. Money's scheme isn't really explored in any depth in this game, but in Presentable Liberty, it's heavily, heavily implied that he caused the apocalypse, and all because he wanted to become richer than he already was. So with that in mind, the ultimate meaning of exoptable money is that not only is the pursuit of money ultimately pointless, but it will kill you if you take it too far. Money can protect you from a lot of things, but not from apocalypse, and to cause an apocalypse in the pursuit of money is to sign your own death certificate. Mm, okay, so maybe I overanalyzed this a bit too much. I mean, Wirtpole himself even said that he made this game in three days. I sincerely doubt there was this much thought put into the messaging. The game is surprisingly lighthearted and seems to revel in its own absurdity. Also, why do I find Madame Sinclair forgetting to write something so funny? Am I fucking dumb?
Don't answer that. I don't know what's up with Madame Sinclair. She slides into your DMs the second you start making money, says, Hello, I'm Madame Sinclair. I noticed you were making money. I did that once. Are we friends now? And then she kills your cat, and then she gets upset that you aren't responding to her, and then she forgets about being mad because her family is dead, and then she dies. Not exactly sure how I'm supposed to feel about this character, you know? And yeah, unfortunately, this game kind of functions like it was made in three days. It runs fine, but you kind of get the sense that certain things didn't get fought through enough. So the cat, right? Apparently in an older version of the game you could save the cat by not sending it out to collect money. Which might seem purposeful at first glance, like maybe the refusal to exploit your cat's labor is being rewarded. But the game still thinks you sent it out, and Madame Sinclair still kills it. Obviously the game thought that you were going to send your cat out and instead the event is triggered by either the amount of money you have or by purchasing a specific item. Apparently the way this gets wrecked was by having the cat zoom off right before, which, sure, all right. Do you also Markiplier being scolded for the faulty organs he was producing, even though he hadn't produced any yet? Okay. But honestly, I don't care about any of that. I don't know if the game was intended to be analyzed like this, but I don't know. The trailer makes it clear that it's about committing atrocities in the name of wealth. So I'm not completely crazy, but whatever. It's a neat little game either way. I love that funky little jam that plays on a loop for the whole game. <laughs> love that the currency is just called monies. And this game, whether it intended it or not, also serves as a good setup. What little plot there is with Dr. Money and the virus is carried over and expanded on in the sequel, Presentable Liberty. Presentable Liberty was released on December 26, 2014. It has a pretty simple premise. You are locked in a jail cell, and people are sending you letters, and that's kind of it. The story and characters exist entirely within the letters. There isn't anything else to move the plot along. And while that might sound lame, it's actually a huge reason why I think this game is so great. You find out from the letters that the virus Dr. Money created in Exopo Money has infected everyone in your town, and because you're locked up in a cell and have had no human contact, you're one of the few not infected. A baker named Charlotte also somehow managed not to get infected, and she's barricaded herself inside her bakery. She's reached out to you because she's desperate for human contact. You're also being written to by Sal, a traveler who knew you before you got locked up, and Mr. Smiley, who was your assigned happy buddy. He has been hired by Dr. Money to keep you happy so you don't kill yourself, and Dr. Money needs you alive for some reason. He's being a fucking creep about it though. The letters are very spread out and leave you with a lot of free time in the cell. Like, a lot of free time. Your happy buddy gets you a Dr. Money portable entertainment machine, hell yeah, but otherwise, it's incredible just how small and even claustrophobic this place feels. Usually when a visual medium wants to convey isolation, it's done with large spaces, big empty worlds designed specifically to make you feel small. Wide shots, for instance. Good standard way to go about imparting loneliness. Long shots of characters in empty spaces, which help impart the emptiness that they're feeling. But Presentable Liberty does the exact opposite. The prison cell is tiny, there's no room to walk, there's a window, but it's too high to look out of. There's not much to look at while you're waiting for the next letter, so you start to notice small details like, why are there wires on the wall? And why is the only other door you could see just a regular door? Aren't you in a prison? It really makes you excited whenever a letter finally comes in, even as things start to get bad. As the game goes on, Charlotte falls deeper and deeper into despair. Sal comes home and is shocked by the state of it, and your happy buddy becomes more and more desperate to keep you happy, to the point that he starts selling off everything he owns, including a lung. It gets to the point where he completely drops his happy persona, telling you that he has been blackmailed into this position because Dr. Money kidnapped his daughters, but he just found out that they're dead. So now he has no reason to keep you happy, but at the same time, he has no reason to go on. So he does one final good deed for you and sells off all his organs to get you a new game. While that's all going on, Charlotte has finally reached her breaking point and is begging you to come see her. You can't, of course, and when she finally realizes that... The only 
only person you have left is Sal, who decides he's going to break you out. He gets into the prison and figures out that the building isn't actually a prison and that your cell door is powered by electricity. He goes to destroy the generator and... Well, Sal's dead now too. Everyone's dead. The only person left is Dr. Money, who is doing everything he possibly can to convince you to stay. He points out that there's literally nobody out there waiting for you and promises to keep you safe in your little cell. So now you finally have a choice. If you choose to leave, you can walk down a hallway and find a switch. Your jail cell was an elevator the entire time. And when you wander out into the streets, oh God, Charlotte was right here the entire time. She left us a cake and a note saying how glad she is that we managed to get out and we head out into the empty city to start our life. The end. It's honestly kind of amazing the way that this game manages to make you feel so isolated. Just by stripping everything away and having the bulk of the gameplay be through these letters alone, it almost forces you to become attached. You see this reflected really well in Markiplier's playthrough. When he starts the game, he's doing the typical YouTuber thing. Giving all the characters goofy voices. But it seems that you and I are the last people in this town who are still not affected by the virus. Singing funny songs. La la la, happy, happy, happy. Happy, la la la, happy to be alive! And almost completely ignoring the letters as they come in. Then as the video goes on, he just stops doing that. He starts giving the characters normal voices. This the town has no electricity anymore. The only lights I see are coming from the prison. And stops fooling around and just sits there, waiting anxiously for the letters to come in. Charlie. And he barely edited the video, so you get to watch this happen in real time. Goody, goody morning! All good, all fine, I don't care. Oh my god. I think if you aren't going to play this game for yourself, this is the next best way to experience it. I mean, you should you should play it for yourself, but you know, otherwise. Watching a tiny pixelated room beat the YouTuber out of a man is definitely a little unsettling. All right, I guess I gotta go back to normal Markiplier Let's Play. Oh, ha ha, fun, happy games. Oh! and does go to show just how well it manages to suck you in and just how attached you get to these people you never meet. Just by stripping away everything else, these letters become your entire world and these people you never meet leave a surprisingly big impact on you because of that. It's almost devastating when they die, even though you don't know them at all. The only glimpse you get of them are purely through their words, though very rarely they do something that almost breaks through to you. There is, of course, the moment where Sal breaks the generator, but there's another smaller moment earlier on. Charlotte sends a letter saying that she found an old gramophone in the basement, and then suddenly, we can hear it. It feels like confirmation that Charlotte is a real actual person who has a real actual effect on this universe, not just some text on paper. And she's close. I can hear her. Then the music stops. Charlotte doesn't even know if you heard the music, and this is the point when it becomes very, very clear what she intends to do. She starts begging you to come to her. You can't. You physically can't. And you have no way of telling her that or even offering comfort of any kind. And then Sal writes to say he heard some music but couldn't figure out where it came from. And this is when I start having a crisis because if I could just tell Sal to go to Charlotte's bakery, it would save Charlotte's life. But I can't. And then you're happy but he tells you that he's going to sell all his organs to buy you a game and you can't tell him that you don't want him to. Come on, dude. I haven't beat a single one of the games you already gave me. I don't need any more. In other games, not having choices and how the story goes seems like either a flaw or it's just ignored completely. But in this game, it uses that to hurt you. Even in games whose entire point is that you don't have a choice, do give you some kind of an input. So it feels like there has to be some kind of option to save your friends or 
communicate with them or something, but that option never comes. It creates such a sincere feeling of helplessness as everyone starts dying around you and you can't do anything to stop it. Just from what I've seen from people discussing this game, the general consensus seems to be that this game is a metaphor for depression. The isolation, being trapped, and being unable to communicate with those reaching out to you is all very indicative of that. I'm not sure that every aspect of this game is metaphorical though. I mean, both Dr. Money and the virus were elements from Exoptable Money, and that game had nothing to do with depression. I always personally thought Dr. Money was supposed to represent Big Pharma due to the whole making a virus in order to sell the cure thing, and also his name is Dr. Money. I'm a little lost in what the happy buddy would represent in that case though. I mean, my first thought that maybe he was an ineffective therapist, but I'm not sure that really fits. I mean, why would Big Pharma be blackmailing someone into offering mental health services? I'm not sure that the characters really slot nicely into one particular spot, and frankly, I'm less interested in what each character represents and more interested in what they offer to the experience. So, um, Dr. Money has complete and under control over your life. He has you locked away and keeps you isolated from everyone who cares about you or wants to help you. He keeps you prisoner under the guise that it's for your own good, that the world outside is dangerous, but he just sees you as a valuable piece of merchandise, a piece of meat to sell off to the highest bidder, and he can't let your happiness get in the way of that. Honestly, he could be Big Pharma, keeping you alive only to profit off you, but he could also be depression itself, locking you up and gaslighting you to keep you in line. But either way, he is reinforcing your imprisonment. The happy buddy is an ineffective caretaker, somebody who is extremely ill-equipped to help you, but gets saddled with the responsibility anyways. As a result, the only thing he could think of to help you is to scream, be happy, don't be sad, and send you distractions. <laughs> Neither actually solves the problem, and underneath his happy, excitable persona, he isn't actually any better off than you are. When he learns that you aren't his responsibility anymore, he doesn't just abandon you, but gives everything he has left for one last gift. This is the one time his happy persona fades. He gives you one more distraction, acknowledging that he knows it won't help, but it's the only thing he could do for you. And that's it. One quick glimpse under the mask and he's gone forever. You talked to him all this time and you never got to see the real him until it was too late. Charlotte is in the exact same boat you are, and she reaches out to because you are locked up like she is and can relate to her struggle. And over the course of the game, she comes to depend on you. You've become Charlotte's ineffective caretaker, someone who is extremely ill-equipped to help her but is saddled with the responsibility anyways. Except you can't even interact with her at all. Charlotte is reaching out to the only person she could find to help her, and she is getting literally no response. Despite this, she starts to expect you to save yourself and then her, but of course you can't. It's not possible. And once she realizes that, that she put all her faith into someone who can't come to her, who can't help her, and can't even respond to her, she takes her own life. Sal is your old friend, the one character you actually know, and who gives you gifts to remind you of the outside world. Sal is the only connection that you have not only to the outside world, but to who you were before you were locked up. Sal is also the one character who doesn't want anything from you. Charlotte wants you to save her, Happy Buddy wants his daughters, Dr. Money is a whore, but Sal just wants his friend back, and he goes to ridiculous lengths to get you. And he succeeds! The link to your past sets you free, but unfortunately you lose it in the process. Though, not completely. In the beginning of the game, Sal sends you a bug, and that bug survives and follows you out into the world, signifying that not only does a small part of your past live on despite everything, but that you're not completely alone. And it's extremely meaningful the way that you do escape. Not just that Sal dies to save you, but in that you learn that your prison is an elevator without a button. This isn't just a fun twist, it means that you had the means to escape the entire time. You just needed outside help to do it. And Sal, being the one person who genuinely wanted to help you, was ultimately the one to do it. Now, as far as the metaphor goes, my dear friend who did not want to be named, but whom I often talk about my stupid interests with, made a good point when it came to Charlotte. If you and Charlotte are in the same boat, supposedly both suffering from the same thing, why is it that Charlotte is able to send messages and you aren't when the lack of being able to communicate is an important feature. And, um, huh. 
I mean, there is an in-story reason that you're a prisoner and she isn't, but yeah, it does kind of mess with the metaphor a little. Maybe it's supposed to show how painful it is when you do reach out and receive no response. Maybe she's suffering from a different mental illness. Or maybe in this case, we do have to chalk it up to it being a video game. If Charlotte couldn't write to you, she wouldn't be in this game because that's just how the mechanic works. Just like how the letters work within this game also doesn't make a lot of logical sense. Yeah, you probably noticed it too. They just sort of pop into existence without anyone delivering them and are very short and split up. They're set up more like text messages than any kind of actual letter. Also, Dr. Money starts telling you at one point to ignore all the letters Sal is sending you, but like, couldn't you just not deliver them? Or how about how after the power goes out, Dr. Money is sending you letter after letter telling you not to go out the open door? It is he crouched behind the door just sliding them under? But yeah, honestly, I don't really care about any of that. Like, God forbid this free pixelated indie game takes some liberties with how the world works, you know? The only thing that ever kind of bothered me was the last letter Charlotte sent. And not because the idea that someone slipped their wrist and then addressed and stamped an envelope is kind of ridiculous. Honestly, I could live with that. The issue I had was that it seemed to put shock value over dramatic tension. Cause like, right after you get this letter, Sal comes up with a plan to get you out, the door opens, and you go next door to Charlotte's bakery and see the blood and her final message to you. Wouldn't this moment be so much more impactful if you didn't get the blood-soaked letter? If you didn't know if Charlotte was dead or alive and you thought that you might have a chance to save her? Wouldn't that make the blood in the bakery and her last message all the more devastating? I'm not the only person to make this criticism. I stumbled across a guy while I was researching for this who said, The whole time during the escape sequence, I felt like I had no reason to escape because Charlotte was dead. And then I noticed that in Jacksepticeye's playthrough, he shared a similar sentiment. I found this generator, friend. I only need to destroy this and you will be free. What's the point? And then it hit me. From a dramatic standpoint, yes. The escape would be much, much more tense if we thought that there was a chance to save Charlotte. But if we're looking at it from a metaphorical standpoint, then getting the confirmation that she's dead before we leave actually makes much more sense. You only get one choice in the entire game, and it's right here, where you have the option to leave the cell. Right before we get this choice, Dr. Money reminds us that there is nothing out there for us. Everyone we know is dead. All of humanity is dead. And there is a chance that if we go out there, we'll be dead too. In this moment, with no other information, staying in the cell seems like the safer option. But of course, it isn't. If you choose to stay, Dr. Money reveals that he injected you with the only cure to the virus and then harvests your organs. This means a couple of things. First, Dr. Money only had one cure for the virus, and instead of using it to save his own life, he uses it to make more money. Going back to the theme of going too far in the pursuit of wealth. But two, it means that staying in the cell will kill you. There is no way around it. And since you can't get the virus, there's no actual risk to leaving. But you don't know that when you get the choice. Leaving the prison feels like a huge risk, and one you have to make completely alone. The game treats this one decision as a huge deal, as can be seen in Charlotte's final letter if you escape. What matters is that you're here. Against all odds, you manage to escape the prison. I'm aware that this may seem like a bad ending to this story, but you're here. Charlotte was too afraid to leave the bakery, but you chose to leave your cell, even if there was nothing out there for you. This isn't a game simply about depression, but overcoming depression and taking that first step into recovery. And I think that's really nice. This is just my interpretation, of course, but I stand by it. I'm aware, though, that it's probably not what Wirtpol intended when he made the game, because that one guy I mentioned earlier, the one who disliked the use of the bloody letter, Wirtpol actually agreed that it was flawed and said that he intended on changing the way he handled it in the remake. Yep, the remake.
As early as March 2015, WorkPole, encouraged by the huge YouTubers playing his games and the positive reactions in general, started posting that he was going to continue the series. However, he wasn't particularly satisfied with exoptable money, and Presentable Liberty could use some work too, so he decided that he would kick off the project by remaking them to include more setup for future games. He got the remakes greenlit on Steam, and not too long after decided to come up with a name for the series, Menagerie. A menagerie is a collection of caged animals, so so, yeah, that's pretty fitting. Originally, the plan seemed to be that Workpole was going to remake them himself, but then he decided to make it an HD remake. So he teamed up with a guy known as Hawk Sandwich in February of 2016. The process ended up being a lot more expensive than he was expecting, so in September of 2016, he created a Kickstarter asking for 20,000 euros. Within a few weeks, he started to worry that the Kickstarter wasn't going to be funded and started trying to get the attention of Markiplier and Jacksepticeye in hopes that they might garner enough attention to get it funded, but unfortunately he was unable to do so and the Kickstarter failed, having reached only a tenth of its goal. A second attempt was launched in January of 2017, with the new trailer now showcasing exactly what they intended on accomplishing with the remakes, along with the new animation for Exoptimal Money, and the goal being lowered from 20,000 euros to 12,000 euros. This time, we've lowered the goal to 12,000 euros, and it really is as low as we could possibly go while still being sure that we can deliver great games with it. We still think that there is great interest in this series among the people who know it, and really believe that these remade versions can outdo the originals in story, atmosphere, and style. I wasn't aware of any of this at the time, and apparently I'm not the only one. At one point, Wartpool looked at the analytics and noted that nearly half of everyone who looked at the Kickstarters donated, which shows that there was a genuine interest in what he wanted to do. The problem was that there weren't a lot of people looking at the Kickstarters in the first place, and unfortunately the second Kickstarter failed in February of 2017. While I was in the process of making this, I was looking through the Kickstarter videos on Wartpole's YouTube channel when I noticed a video called Menagerie Archive, All Seven Endings. What I assumed was that the video was an archive of the endings in the two Menagerie games. But what? How is there seven endings? Hello people, I'm the creator of this game and I'd like to show you all the different endings you can get in it. Oh shit, it's a game! And then I immediately closed the video and downloaded the game. I was not going to pass up an opportunity to play one of these blind. Okay, let's start at the beginning here. At the end of January 2017, Wirtpole announced that he was working on a spin-off title called Menagerie Archive to coincide with the second Kickstarter. But unfortunately, just a few weeks later, the Kickstarter failed, and he seemed to lose all interest in the spin-off game. However, about a month later, he posted that he had continued to work on Menagerie Archive, but that he didn't think it was going to turn out very well. Six days after that, he announced that it was done, and that he was going to release it to coincide with the third Kickstarter, which was released on April 23rd, 2017. So now we have this new game. It's not Menagerie Free. It's just a spin-off, but just like the previous two games, it is the same event shown from a new point of view, and Wirtpole claims he put more work into this game than the other two combined. So, hey, that's exciting. Not sure what to expect, but... Oh. Oh, I lost. I lost? You could actually lose this one? Both Exoptimal Money and Presentable Liberty were very passive experiences where you just sort of watched things happen, but not this one. This one is almost completely the opposite. In Menagerie Archive, you play as Dr. Money's newest employee. Your job is to work in the archives, organizing and sending out the files of various citizens as they are requested. Half of this game is just organizing the files. You have to do that part yourself, and I was pretty mortified to discover that I apparently don't know the alphabet. That's how I lost. If you fail to send out free files, you get fired and then you starve to death. Fortunately, after that, I figured out how to navigate around my illiteracy, and I was able to get to the crux of the game, free people writing letters to you. Yup. Just like Presentable Liberty, you have free people and a capitalist writing to you. And also like Presentable Liberty, you can't respond. However, unlike Presentable Liberty, you have complete control over what happens to these people. Yeah, so apparently this whole series takes place in a dystopia where working is a privilege. If you aren't of a certain rank, you aren't allowed to work, and you are completely reliant on the people who do work sharing their paycheck with you. Dr. Money assigns you free people to split your paycheck with. Harvey, 
Rebecca and Claire. You can give them all your money, you could split it evenly, or you could just starve them and keep all the money for yourself. And the whole time they are writing you letters to tell you exactly what they think of you, with them being extremely kind and grateful if you treat them well, and hurt and angry if you don't. But other than that, the way you choose to distribute the money changes the game up in some surprisingly subtle ways. Rebecca, for example, gets infected with the virus and dies no matter what you do, but giving her less money means that she dies quicker. Same thing with Harvey. The only way I got him to the end of the game alive was to keep piling money on him, and as a result, I got some dialogue that I otherwise wouldn't have gotten. The game is surprisingly complex in the amount of unique interactions you get. There's nearly 800 individual letters this time around, and the many endings of this game reflect heavily on your choices. This also means that there is a lot more replay value than the previous two games. In his endings video, Wirtpole says he didn't expect anyone to play this game seven times. Uh, but yeah, no one has done it yet, so I guess I'm gonna do it myself because you really can't be expected to play this game seven times over to get all the different endings. But I played it at least ten times, trying to get not just all the endings, but all the interactions with the characters. I find it extremely interesting that the only happy ending your character gets is the one where you starve everybody to death, hoard all the wealth for yourself, and then spend it on useless shit you don't even need. I mean, yeah, there's one other ending where you don't die, but that one just leaves you as a slave to the system forever. But in this ending, you get promoted and become a close personal friend of Dr. Money. How crazy is that? That the only way you get rewarded in this game is by killing free people in the pursuit of luxury. The other endings are various shades of death. There's the one I got right away where you get fired and die. The one where you never buy food for yourself and then die. And the rest, surprisingly enough, revolve around the character Claire. Claire starts off as being a giant brat, demanding that you give her at least 24 monies, way more than what is reasonable. And if you give her any less, even if it's enough for her to live comfortably, she throws a giant fit and reports you to Dr. Money. She genuinely believes that Dr. Money is a just ruler, because up until now, she has benefited from the system. But now that she's not, she's being awakened to the cruel reality that she's living in a dystopian hell. If you decide to go down the route of starving her to death, it's actually kind of heartbreaking watching her realize that the system is actively murdering her and nobody above her is going to listen to anything she has to say. But if you don't kill her, there are three directions her character can go. You could give her the exact amount of money she asked for, and she won't change or grow in any way. You could treat her cruelly, barely giving her enough to live, and she will blame you for everything, seeing you as someone who has taken advantage of the system. The second she gets the opportunity to kill kill you, she takes it, and she sees it as doing a public service. If you consistently give her enough to live though, she realizes that the root of her problems isn't one guy just a smidge above her on the totem pole, it's the system itself. And instead of murdering you, she joins the resistance in order to dismantle the system and take down the people who benefit from it. This was the first ending I got, aside from the one where I got fired and died, and I was so proud that I radicalized Claire. And then I blew up. This is, according to the endings video work poll made, the canon ending. Um, and it's the one that leads to presentable liberty, and it's probably the best ending you can get in the game. Which is odd, because there was nothing in presentable liberty to suggest that there was a revolution going on, but maybe he'd add some stuff about it in the remake? I'm gonna be honest though, I started to hear the Papers, Please theme playing in my head after I got this letter from the Resistance. Like, I don't know, a game where you work at a government job where you have to make difficult decisions regarding the well-being of other people, and an underground resistance trying to get you to use your position to help their cause. I don't think it's a ripoff by any means, but the two games are very similar. And if we were to look at Menagerie Archive as a standalone game, yeah, no, Papers, Please is much better constructed. But Menagerie Archive isn't a standalone game, and it works very, very well as part of the Menagerie series. It serves as almost a foil to Presentable Liberty. Instead of being denied, choice and having helplessness forced upon you, you have the choice to force helplessness on other people. And it serves as a decent setup, too. All of Dr. Money's records have been destroyed. The people are rising up. A member of the Resistance has retained Dr. Money's trust. Claire has a gun and is 
fucking pissed. It definitely shows the direction Wartpole wanted to take the story and introduces some new potentially reoccurring characters. Maybe some that we'd be able to play as? That's complete speculation on my part, but I could definitely imagine a game where you play as Dr. Money's treacherous secretary. And honestly, I was blown away by just the amount of effort put into this game. Like, Wartpool originally wanted to allow you to draw all over the walls in Presentable Liberty, but he couldn't figure out how to make it work. But look! Look at this! Obviously, it isn't anything phenomenal, but it is growth. Not only are there now choices, but these are choices that actually carry weight and have very noticeable consequences. That's something I admire about Wartpole. The way he was able to work around his limitations, the way he turned something simple into something complex and interesting, and the way he was actively striving to make bigger and better games. I have no doubt that he had the ability to make something amazing. He just needed outside help to do it. Wartpole was aware that a lot of Presentable Liberty fans only knew his game because Mark and Jack played it, and was actively trying to contact them in hopes that they might spread the word about his Kickstarter. While he never says it explicitly, I'm pretty sure he made Menagerie Archive in hopes that Mark or Jack would play it, and unfortunately, they didn't. The third Kickstarter failed, and Wartpole went quiet. If he posted about the failure, he deleted it after, and his social media accounts featured only the occasional live stream before petering out to nothing. And then in June 2018, Wirtpole, real name Robert Brock, took his own life. He was 21 years old. I didn't find out about any of this until shortly after Thanksgiving of 2019, when I remembered that Presentable Liberty existed and decided to revisit Mark's video. The top comment detailed everything that happened to work poll, and I was floored. I ended up spending days scrolling through his social media, looking through his YouTube page and his Game Jolt page. The last game work poll ever uploaded to Game Jolt is a game called Goodbye World. I've seen people point to this as a sign as to what was going to happen to him, but I don't think that's completely fair. This game was a school project that Robert Brock did as a collaborative effort with four other people, and there wasn't anything dark in it. It's just a cute little meta game with some light puzzle elements. The title most likely refers to the ways you can mess with the world around you by moving around code. It's still extremely chilling to see the words goodbye world on his game jolt page though, and even more so when you finally get to this floating little blob out here and start making your way into the cave. The game just abruptly ends and says, but tragedy can only be postponed, you know. I don't want to make assumptions in this video. I think it's easy to find out that Robert Brock took his own life and then look at Presentable Liberty and say, well, I can't be too surprised. He was obviously depressed. I basically said that too when I found out. But the thing is, I don't know what his mental state was when he made Presentable Liberty. I never met the man. I don't know anything about his personal life or anything about him aside from what I can glean online. I don't even know what his intentions were with Presentable Liberty. Maybe it is a story about depression, or maybe he wanted to expand on the lore and exalt money, or maybe he wanted to try and experiment with storytelling techniques. I I don't know. I will never know. And on that same note, I don't know if the failed Kickstarters were the reason he took his life. He was definitely very down on himself about them. Hello people, I'm the creator of this game and I'd like to show you all the different endings you can get in it. Um, because no one else has done it yet. This happened fairly quickly with Presentable Liberty, which only had two endings. Uh, but yeah, no one has done it yet, so I guess I'm gonna do it myself because you really can't be expected to play this game seven times over to get all the different endings. But there might have been, and probably were, outside factors that I'll never know about. And saying that solely is the reason it happened is putting a lot of blame on people who don't deserve it. You're allowed to not want to give your money to a Kickstarter. You're allowed to not play a game on your channel. I am not blaming Mark or Jack for this. I want to make that very, very clear. But what struck me most out of all of this was that the videos Mark and Jack made on Wirtpole's games got millions and millions of views, and both said that they liked them a lot. I like stopped playing the game and just started living it halfway through that! That was amazing! Absolute props to the people who made this game! 
That was such an enjoyable hour of my life. But Wurtpole still spent the last few years of his life literally begging for money so he could keep making games. Exposure can be a great thing, a really, really great thing, if you happen to be at the right place at the right time. But most of the time, it isn't enough. I regret not knowing about the Kickstarters when they were active. I'm sure I would have given to them probably not a lot because I was a broke college student at the time, but God, I loved these games and I'd love to have seen more. Hell, I think Presentable Liberty would be an insane VR game, but it'll never happen now. The Menagerie series, a series created with passion and excitement and love, has ended on the most tragic note it ever could have, and before it even got a chance to really start. I also regret that I found out about Robert Brock's death from a comment on a Markiplier video a year and a half after it happened. It seems a lot of people found out this way. It's just really upsetting to me that even now, this is all still unknown. I don't want Robert Brock or his games to fade into obscurity. and. It's a shame that people don't know about them or what happened to him. And trust me, I know I have no pull on this platform, but I don't know, maybe someone will watch this, somebody who's never heard of these games before, and maybe they'll play them for themselves and they'll come up with their own interpretations or at least just think about them, at least just remember them, because Robert Brock and his creations deserve to be remembered.